This is Peter Helland on the show Israel, and I've titled the show, <clears throat> A Sucker is Born Every Minute. And maybe the younger people don't know about that quote. I grew up on it. <clears throat> My, um, where I'm from is Wisconsin Dells, and about 15 miles away is Baraboo, Wisconsin, where the Ringling Brothers uh, have been, I guess, about 1865, and they were there till about three years ago. It's called the Ringling Brothers Ringling and Barnum Circus. Uh, for some reason, my mom, I felt like she knew those the, that Ringling family. So she brought it, the, that phrase up all the time, a sucker is born every minute. <clears throat> and I always thought, well, P.T. Barnum said it. Well, if you do a little uh, Google search, uh, briefly where that phrase came from was around 1880, somebody uh, made a lifelike figure of a giant, like a Goliath. And then he buried it, and then he acted like he discovered it in the ground, you know, to, to create a scene and to get attention. Well, then somebody bought it so he could put it on display and charge people money. Well, then P.T. Barnum came along and th thought that he would buy it from that guy and be part of his circus uh, repertoire. Well, then the guy sued and went to court, and P.T. Barnum uh, was able to win the lawsuit because he was able to prove the thing was a fraud from the beginning. And somewhere along the line, it might have been a banker who somebody who said it might not have been P.T. Barnum. But through that whole process, which was like unbelievable, I guess, uh, somebody said, a sucker is born every minute. Uh, the scripture that I've been really liking to look at, uh, especially in light of the uh, coronavirus uh, scandal, um, it, ju it just amazes me as I've been watching the coronavirus that, that anybody would, would, uh, would believe anything that's being said without thoroughly checking it out. It just amazes me. Uh, the Bible says, prove all things, test all things. Uh, the, uh, the country, the government, uh, anytime events like this happen, it usually always turns out to be just full of deception. And, and of course, it looks like that's another case of this, you know, like case number 37. You know, it's like, I mean, at the moment, people are fixated on this deception or this scandal. But if you go look back, the pattern has been there all along. So 2 Thessalonians um, chapter 2, let's get the context, uh, verse 8. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So for, for those watching, this is, a good, this is a good verse to have. It says, that the, the essence of it is, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved, and for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So if you decide not to receive the love of the truth, if you decide not to orientate your life primarily and put everything in subjection to this uh, purpose, if, if your purpose in life is not God in the pursuit of things related to God, uh, we almost have a promise here um, for this cause. Because they did not receive the love of the truth, for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. And a sucker is born every minute. Because that's the reality. If you were to talk to B.T. Barnum, P.T. Barnum, 
I mean, and the, whoever came up with that phrase, what they were observing is that people were suckers. They would believe anything. And oftentimes, looking back in the past, when a preacher would come to town, the one that drew the most people had the most uh, deception and falseness to them. And you wouldn't think that. But that's often the case. Broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many are on it. Narrow is the way to eternal life, and only a few are on it. So if you tend to follow the majority, um, it says in Deuteronomy, I think it is, whoever follows the, the multitude uh, into a sin, I mean, it, just, it, it really criticizes somebody that just blindly is a copycat, following people, and doesn't really know where he's going. He doesn't really know what it's about. He's just a copycat. And basically, he's a sucker. And I don't think we should be suckers. But the problem is, this country has been deceived from the beginning. So that the only way out is the grace of repentance. And repentance is accomplished by confessing your sins and the sins of your fathers. And unless we can start confessing those sins of the fathers and the things that have gone in the past. So let's just, let's just see where we've been uh, taken as suckers by the devil. Okay, the first one is, of course, 1776. And I've mentioned this all the time. And this is the book uh, that I've used. This is the original. I have one of the last four copies of the original. American patriotism farther confronted with reason, scripture, and the tradition in the Constitution. And this is John Fletcher, the second in command to John Wesley, who started the, uh, the biggest church in America for a long time, Methodist Church. And in here, he says, uh, observations on the dangerous politics taught by the theologians for the American patriots. And at the core of the deception is this notion that we, we all carry it about. I mean, uh, almost every American to this day, I don't care how astute they are, they seem to all fall for the deception. And what do they say? We're a nation uh, of law, okay, and it's, and it's ruled by the people. It's ruled by the people. In other words, we've been taught in all our civics classes, everywhere we go, that we're a republic or we're a democracy, and it's ruled by the people, of the people, for the people, by the people, that the authority comes from the people. That's in the Declaration of Independence. It's in our Constitution. The Constitution says, we the people ordain this Constitution. The Constitution refuses to acknowledge God. It mentions the year of the Lord, no court has ever considered that an acknowledgment of God. So the Constitution, the U.S. Constitution does not acknowledge God. So when we say, well, the government, well, the, the people are the, are the government. People are the master, the governments are servant. Well, no government means the ones in charge. So are the people the government or is the government the government? See, we start out with doublespeak right away. So right away we're lost. Because we go, well, uh, the government. Oh, are you talking about the people? Because the people are the ones in charge, right? We're the master. And Donald Trump and Governor Holcomb here in Indiana, they're our servant. Oh, so are they the government or not? Or are we the government? See, so it's total confusion right from the get-go. And that's what Fletcher said. He said, these principles are actually the same principles of Satan himself. And of course, the country was started by Masons. So I wouldn't just dismiss Fletcher. He wrote, I mean, he wrote many pamphlets, many books in 75 and 76. And then he tops it off by this here, which I've never gone into much before. But I think it's even better now because uh, a sucker is born every minute. And we got suckered. And the proof we got suckered in the American Revolution is this right here. 
This is called the Proceedings, the Proceedings of the National Convention to Secure the Religious Amendment of the Constitution of the United States. So they were trying to push in the middle of the Civil War in the North for an amendment to the Constitution so that we would acknowledge God and Jesus Christ in the Constitution. Because these guys, these were the presidents of colleges, Supreme Court justices, governors, these were the leading Christians in the nation got together. And many, not all, many concluded that the Civil War was primarily a punishment for not acknowledging God in the Constitution. They actually said that. In other words, yeah, the Civil I mean, slavery was an, you know, was an issue, of course, in the North. Slavery was a, a terrible sin for a lot of them. But mainly, we forgot to acknowledge God. We failed to acknowledge God. We purposely didn't acknowledge God. And the Civil War was the result, 70 years later. So, you know, we thought we were getting away with it. But... You never get away with it. And, and America was warned vehemently. So here, here is Fletcher. This is a book he wrote prior to this one. A vindic it was a vindication of uh, John Wesley on something he wrote. So he's writing here, and don't forget, if you look at throughout the history of the church in the last 300 years, the battle has kind of been in the Protestant realm between the Arminians, that's Wesley and the Methodists, the Arminians, and the Calvinists. That would be the Old school Baptists, the Presbyterians, and uh, a little bit of the Anglicans, maybe. Okay, here's here's Fletcher writing um, about his battle with Calvin, and but 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 he's taking his battle of Calvin and he's turning it on the heads of the Patriots because all thirteen colonies were were supposedly noted for being. Calvinist. All 13 colonies were considered Calvinist. This was a Calvinist uh, uh, experiment that we were in, that we, that we continue to be in in some fashion because all 13 colonies were, their teaching was founded on John Calvin, and then I would further add uh, a disciple of Calvin, John Knox. Fletcher writes, Calvin himself, though a strong Republican, was frightened at the rapid progress of this civil enthusiasm. And in several pages, he was going on about how people went crazy getting rid of the king and then having their own republics. I mean, they were just wild. So, so Calvin was, you know, trying to go, whoa, this horse is out of control. Hence it is, Fletcher writes, that when he drew up a confession of faith for the Reformed churches of France and Geneva, he bestowed the the two last articles of it upon the error which our American brethren and you, sir, are running headlong into. As you are probably a perfect stranger to these articles, I shall faithfully transcribe them from my French common prayer book. Okay. So this was written six months before he wrote this book, 1775-76. So he really highlights here that the fundamental error of the patriots was this notion that uh, the people create the government. So we're the master. And he was saying over and over again, that's going to overturn all relationships. He says, you know what that's going to do to the husband-wife relationship? Because now authority comes from the consent of the governed. That'll make the wife the head. And the slave-master relationship? Uh, the slave will think he's in charge. Okay, so all these relationships are going to be turned on their head, which is, of course, what's been happening. So here's, here was Calvin's article number 39 and 40 that he put in his Confession of Faith that it looks like all 13 colonists, all 13 colonies who were Calvinists failed to look at, didn't want to look at. Here's what Calvin wrote. We believe that God will have the world to be governed by laws and civil powers, that the lawless inclinations of men may be curbed. And therefore, he has established kingdoms and republics and other sorts of government, some hereditary and some otherwise, together with whatsoever belongs to judicature. And you'll have to look that word up, okay? Judicature relating to government. And he, God, will be acknowledged the author of government. To this end, he has put the sword in the hands of rulers to punish not only the sins which are committed against the commandments of the second table of the Ten Commandments, but also those 
which are committed against the precepts of the first table. We ought then not only to bear for his sake that rule should have dominion over us, but it is also our bounden duty to honor them and to esteem them worthy of all reverence, considering them as God's lieutenants and officers, which he has commissioned to execute a lawful and holy commission. Just look at what's happened. We, the Calvinists who started this whole, started the revolution, all 13 colonies, rejected this, went totally against this, and now what do we have? Instead of people obeying St. Paul, he said, first of all, before all things, I want prayers, supplications, intercessions, giving of thanks that are to be made for kings and those in authority. And all men, but kings and those in authority. No, we feel that we can dishonor. The slaves felt they could dishonor their master. John Brown was going to arm them up with, with guns so they could basically kill their master. Uh, Theodore Parker was Lincoln's favorite. He said, it's the duty of the slave to kill his master. That was the North, and that was the Republicans. And it was Hinton, Hinton Rowan and Helper, uh, the impending crisis. Uh, the Republicans were passing that out to everybody in Congress and the Senate, said the same thing as Theodore Parker. It was the duty of the slaves to kill their masters. And these were the Republicans um, who, uh, it was well known in Wisconsin, uh, there was an article in the Capital Times there because Tommy Thompson, a Republican, and I knew about it, but they put an article in that the Republicans were really, the foundation of the Republican Party were foyerites, they were, they were Marxist, they were communist. It's Republicans. Um, look, the, look, just look that up. Uh, Brisbane uh, was the guy here, but um, Feuerites uh, were the name of this group. They set up uh, communities to see if they could make money by living in community. They found out by living in community they couldn't make as much money as if they went individual. But it was about the, the accumulation of wealth, the pursuit of happiness, and they started communes. It was a communistic commune to achieve that, and then it didn't work. But that was the base for the Republican Party, and you can, you can track that down. Um, but as he as uh, this this commission uh, committee said, the Civil War was a consequence of the punishment that God laid upon the country for not acknowledging Him in the Constitution, which then goes to Fletcher's argument that the Patriots were in rebellion to Christianity, cloaking themselves with Christianity, but at its core, Masonic and turning all these godly relationships, which the Bible calls sound doctrine. Paul said, be careful to preach sound doctrine. And then he basically defines sound doctrine as honor and obey the king. Wives, uh, obey your husband as unto Christ. Slaves, obey your slave master as unto Christ. And children like that was basically the essence of sound doctrine, which St. Paul said, they're definitely going to try to subvert whole houses, and he actually says, especially those of the circumcision, to overturn those relationships. And Fletcher was warning, they're overturning those relationships by the principles that we fought for in that war. And they were violating their own leader, John Calvin. So he says, repeating it, we ought then not only to bear for his sake, for Christ's sake, that rule should have dominion over us, but it is also our bounden duty to honor them, whether it's President Obama, whether it's President Clinton, whether it's President Bush or President Trump. Now we know the people that like Bush, they hated Clinton, generally. The people that liked Obama hate Trump. So you always got 50% of the country hardly can go through one day in their life without cursing the president. Now people were cursing Obama under their, you know, Quietly, they didn't show it, they get in trouble. But Trump, they can just curse right out in the open. Okay, but those curses are not really going to Trump. They're going on the person giving it. Because Jesus said, if you curse your parents, you're to be put to death. And he said it twice, because it said the Old Testament a lot. But it also says you're not to curse a ruler of the people. So if you think you can Curse Obama, even in your thought, it says in Ecclesiastes, if you think you can do that, 
It says, don't even curse him in your thought uh, without thinking that you're, you're, you think you're not going to reap a whirlwind. You think you can go and fornicate. You're going to have sex outside of marriage of any kind. And you, but God's already said he's going to judge the fornicate. So you, you're not aware of what you're going to reap. What? Well, you're a sucker. You're a sucker. Okay, that's Article 39. Here's Article 40. That supposedly the 13 colonies were Calvinists. This is their leader. Uh, who did they follow? Article 40. John Calvin. We maintain, therefore, that we are bound to obey their laws and statutes to pay tribute, taxes, and other duties. Didn't they start the revolution claiming uh, we don't have to pay tax because we're not represented? We don't, you don't have our consent. We don't consent to you taxing us, so we don't have to pay. That's not what John Calvin says. We maintain, therefore, that we are bound to obey their laws and statutes to pay tribute, taxes, and other duties, and to bear the yoke of obedience freely. Yeah, there's freedom right there, freely. And with goodwill, though they should be unbelievers, King George was not considered an unbeliever. King George, I think the third, ruled about 60 years, and he was considered a believer. And many people admired his Christianity. So you can't get away with saying, well, he was a tyrant. John Witherspoon, the leading minister and clergyman of the whole Constitution and Declaration of Independence Conventions, tutored over 100 of the founding fathers, President of Princeton, personally tutored the father of the Constitution, John James Madison. Witherspoon insisted that King George was not a tyrant. John Adams said the same thing. So on what grounds, based on their own leader, John Calvin, did they justify the war? We don't have to pay tax. John Calvin says, yeah, you do, even if the, even if the, the king or who's ever in charge, he's talking about Republican and monarchies, who's ever in charge, even if they're unbelievers, provided the supreme dominion of God be preserved in its full extent. And therefore, John Calvin, we detest the men. He means, this is uh, Fletcher probably putting this in, he means Republican levelers, which were people that were saying, you know, all men are created equal. You know, uh, Gettysburg Address, that um, Gettysburg Address, uh, Lincoln saying that this land is de dedicated uh, to the proposition that all men are created equal. That's why we are. So everything's got to be totally equal. And uh, Calvin's even addressing that. And therefore, we detest the men who reject superiorities, introduce community and confusion of property, and overthrow the order of justice. And then Fletcher writes to his, who he was writing to, to the American patriots, Sir, you are a Calvinist. You follow the French reformer when he teaches uh, your favorite doctrines, which was um, uh, double predestination. And then he writes, Oh, forsake him not when he follows Christ and teaches that God, not the people, is to be acknowledged the author of power and government, and that we are bound to bear cheerfully for his sake the yoke of scriptural submission to our governors. And he goes on and he says, I am so fully convinced of the truth and importance of Calvin's two last articles of religion that though I have for years checked his errors, if I had the wings of the lightning and a voice like thunder, I would this instance shoot myself across the Atlantic and preach his loyal doctrine to our deluded, our deluded, deceived brethren. A sucker is born every minute. We were suckers. We had no excuse to be a sucker. We were deceived. And we go, oh, oh, you know, we don't want to admit that. <laughs> and once somebody's deceived, everybody knows they fight tooth and nail not to have to admit it. Tooth and nail they'll fight. But until you repent and confess the sins of your fathers, which you're walking in, you have no hope. You have no hope of salvation. At least um, maybe on the political level. But these are still serious sins. Um, they, are, they will be affecting your... Uh, your salvation. So that's what happened then. We were suckers then. And 
God then sends um, uh, Dr. E. Michael Jones, uh, he really backs the position that revolutions turn into civil wars. And I think he understands it better than I do. Um, but we do see that. That was a revolution. And uh, I was just watching a little news clip on Fox News, um, this lady named Janine, and you probably know who she is. And I just picked out a 10 second clip. And she starts the show and says, we're Americans. We're, we're uh, revolutionaries. We're rebels. It's in our DNA. You can't keep Americans down. Born of rebellion and revolution, we are ready to fight. It's in our DNA. We're ready to fight the virus. Hmm. 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 Is that Jesus or is that the devil? Um, so then, anyway, so it did come true. There was a civil war. And the civil war ended up starting with great debates and arguments over slavery. Was slavery just, unjust? And it looks about it, and I spent a lot of time. I had a show, uh, Faith of Our Southern Fathers, for many years, and some, you know, about two hours a week, something new every week, here locally, South Bend. So I learned a whole lot, and it looked like the South always won the arguments. The Southerners knew the Bible better than the North, and even though the South went along with the Revolution, and were wrong about that, it looks like they, were always, they always won the debates when it went on slavery. And people would think, well, that can't be. Slavery is wrong. Well, I understand how we've, you know, we've been taught to feel on that. But take a, just look at the northern bishop, um, Episcopalian bishop, John Henry Hopkins, bishop of Vermont, who after the war then became the bishop of all the Episcopalians in America. They went to him uh, right before the war and in the middle of the war, they went to him to give the definitive biblical position on slavery. And he wrote a 40-page essay, which he then followed up with a 400-page book. And almost completely did he side with the South's position. Even though he was an abolitionist, he said, no, I'm an abolitionist, but I'm going to tell you what the Bible says which agreed with the South. And of course, he almost got, I mean, they tried to excommunicate him. Um, it was terrible for him. Um, but now we're seeing, like here in South Bend, where I'm at, Mayor Pete Buttigieg went to Harvard. And we know that Mayor Pete Buttigieg is um, homosexual. And it turns out that when he was at Harvard, I believe it was exactly the time he was at Harvard, they had a chaplain who was black and homosexual, Peter Goins, and he argued that, well, of course the Bible condones slavery. Slavery is totally permitted in the Bible. Oh, well, I thought we were taught that that wasn't true. Well, he just, he's, in, he's a chaplain at Harvard. He can get away with saying it. He's black and he's gay, and now he can say what everybody has known for 18, 19 centuries to be true. Of course the Bible permits slavery. doesn't permit anything sinful to occur, the master mistreating the slave or the slave d disobeying the master, you know, okay. Well, he gets away with saying it. And he uses that to justify that homosexuality should not be considered a sin either, a twisted, you know, it's a twisted way. But see, once you get suckered theologically and you get a false teaching comes in, a false doctrine usually comes in through the political winds and then you you know, adapt it. Just like the coronavirus, they're using this, you know, and no, they're going to, nothing will ever be the same again. You know, the mantra, nothing, you know, like, you know, like a hypnot, you're just going to hypnotize you, nothing will ever be the same again. And, you know, you're not allowed to ask real good questions. So that was the Civil War. We got suckered, and it, it ended up taking us a path to Sodom and Gomorrah, because once you say, Slavery, the slave-master relationship is a sin. Uh, it's going to open up a door to others. But how'd they get away with it? Because they rejected John Calvin, their main leader. 
And, they, and they, it was predicted by uh, John Fletcher and John Wesley that by saying that the people is the master and the government's our servant, that will destroy the slave-master relationship. And of course, seeing it through that, of course the slave-master relationship is not right. Because if the people are the master and the government's the servant, well, the slave probably should be the master and the slave master the servant. And then after slavery, they went directly to marriage. And marriage almost collapsed. It went crazy in the North. They had so many spiritualists. You know, Lincoln was doing, and his wife were doing those seances in the White House, mainly his wife. Um, and spiritualists everywhere. You're talking tappers and weird stuff, okay? And then you had the love movement. Vic Victoria Woodhull was the first woman to run for president. She was like into the occult. This is where you get, and she hooked up with Cornelius Vanderbilt. And who's the uh, uh, famous gay uh, reporter, uh, Cooper, I think. Al, um, his name is Cooper. And uh, he's related to the Vanderbilts, and he's a gross. He's gross. He's gay. And it goes back. To, uh, Cornelius Cooper was doing occult with uh, Victoria Woodhull, who... This is in the North, who teamed up with Henry Ward Beecher, who used to preach in Indianapolis. This is, this is um, uh, Harry Beecher Stowe. His sister wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin, which Lincoln said, basically, that's what got the war going. But she was hooked up with Beecher, and she was into the whole love thing, you know, sleep with the one you love. The whole love movement just came up after the Civil War that you should be able to sleep with anybody you love and anybody you want to. And, and Henry Ward Beecher then, after he was in Indianapolis, he was in New York City at the Plymouth Church, I think it was. And yeah, he's sleeping with one of the wives in, uh, in his church because this is what was going on after that war. The, the Bible Belt lost, okay? They lost. And the free thinkers, the Marxists, uh, communists, they won. Just check it out. Check, just do your, do your history on how much uh, of that influence was in the North. And I think it was in the paper for 180, day, 180 uh, days in the New York papers about Tilton and Beecher, because Tilton was the guy that was his wife that Beecher was accused of sleeping with. And I guess, you know, it never got resolved. But Beecher was called the Pope of the Protestants. When the war ended, they chose Beecher to give the final sermon at Fort Sumner. And when they had the war in Kansas, you know, it was called Beecher's Rifles, you know. I mean, this is false doctrine like crazy. But that false doctrine won in the Civil War. So even most of the churches, they just assume... They just assume uh, whatever that war determined must be the truth. In fact, and I've said this many times, Mark Knoll, a uh, long time, well, he was at Wheaton uh, College, and now he's been at Notre Dame for uh, quite a while, and he's considered a preeminent, world-renowned Christian historian. And he's famous. When he came to town, it was in the paper. He said, theology today has been mostly determined by the canons, the guns, the canons of Sherman and Grant. So slavery is wrong. Why? Canons and Sherman and Grant determined it. Even though the South won most of the arguments and the debates, the canons have fixed it. Now, you get a gay black pastor at Harvard, he can overturn that. And he did overturn it because now he wants to declare homosexuality is not a sin. So we all know, we've all known since the Civil War, slavery is an absolute sin. I mean, it's atrocious. It's against the Bible all the way. Because the canons of Sherman and Grant have told us. But now Harvard, the Vatican, the chaplain is the highest spiritual position there, I guess. And Peter Goins writes his book and said, oh, we know the Bible so totally allows for slavery. I mean, it's a no-brainer. But we also know that it's wrong. In other words, we know the Bible says it's not a sin, but we know that it's a sin. Higher knowledge. 
So we know the Bible condemns homosexuality, but we can say we're free now. We can say it's not. That's what Peter Buttigieg grew up under, and he believes that most likely. A sucker is born every minute. We're being suckered like crazy. I mean, at core, deep levels. Uh, and when you get suckered, you don't want to admit it. But I wish I had P.T. Barnum. He'd be sitting there snickering. 